So, it's really nice that the organizer invite all the participants in introduce themselves so that we know more or less the boundary of the participants. I realize that uh, there are some confusing because some students, Chinese students, when they introduce themselves, some of them put their family name first. Some of them put their family name last. So this is really, really dangerous. I, I don't know how you can, maybe after the clusterization has been dissolved, maybe you can distinguish the family name of the Chinese participants. And the, the people also talking about the undergrad, the PhD students. PhD students is also another dangerous word in China. Because, for example, in Peking University, after four years undergraduate study, we have five years PhD program. So when the students talking about their first year or second year, that means the, they just studied their graduate studies. But there are also some students mentioned this, their second year in PhD. That means they got already the master degree. So be careful about these defi de definitions. Somehow that is also the way when we study science. Because we must make clear what is our definition. I hope everybody enjoyed this morning about the nuclear fission. So today, then I will try to introduce you the relativity density functional theory for nuclear structure and astrophysics. From your, the audience, you more or less reflect what is important, what is keywords in this field, right? You heard so many times of the equation of states, machine learning, quantum computing, and also fishing and these things. So I will also try to bring you this nuclear the relativity density functional theory for nuclear structure and astrophysics. And uh, before we do that, maybe I should also introduce you what... Uh, what I'm talking about. I noticed that the organizer give me some extra but I prefer to have this extra time within this lecture because I prefer everybody, the lecture to be go on interactively. Otherwise, you will find that uh, nuclear theory is not uh, fine, it's quite difficult, sometimes it's challenging. Therefore, instead of we go faster and uh, go on and on, maybe we could have discussion or question during the lectures. So whenever you have a problem or question, please interrupt me. And uh, I have a total about uh, uh, 260 slides. But uh, don't worry, you know, we can go slowly. And uh, the important thing is that we try to achieve some common understanding. Instead of I finish this uh, this uh, this uh, slide. So the first question I want to ask you is that, uh, in your opinion, what is a nuclear physicist? What is a nuclear physicist? Have you think, think s s s have you thought about that? What what it should be defined as nuclear physicist? I put this nuclear chart, try to give you my definition of nuclear physicist. Nuclear physicist is somebody try to understand all this nuclear in the nuclear chart. How to understand them? This including structure, 
reaction. Apart from that, we should also know the, the past and their future, right? So apart from their structure and reaction, we should know their origins and their decay. So putting together, that's the nuclear physicist. So even though people call each other nuclear physicist, in fact, uh, they don't have overlap. Maybe structure and a old reaction and the astrophysics and the weak process and all of these things, they are correlated, but not, not necessarily overlap with each other. So in such a way that we should try to have some common sense. So from this nuclear chart, there are also several numbers we should remember. Otherwise, how can we define us as nuclear physicists? This number including, in your opinion, how many nuclei could exist? You know, or more or less, that 300 nuclei are stable and they are existing in nature. Or well, we can find that in old daily life. And about three, a little bit more than 3,000 nuclei has been produced, experimented. And then, theoretically, how many are predicted? Do you have uh, any idea that how many are predicted to be exist? There are several predictions. Traditionally, people say 6,000 6, to 7,000 or 8,000. Recently, people talking about the continuum. We put into the contribution of the continuum into account. And then we found that there could be more than 10,000 nuclear stable, up to Z equal 120. If you go to 130, this number could be even more. So this is a number we maybe we should remember when we're talking about that. Then another question comes. This morning, the lecture told us the nuclear physics started after the Chadwick has discovered the neutrons, right? So in your opinion, what is when nuclear physics start? There are different way, right? Different way to define. But in principle, that this the discovery of radioactivity. That's the first time the human being has observed nuclear phenomena. So in this sense, you could say that is the beginning of nuclear physics. But the people might have different way, see, so to say, after the Rutherford experiment, the scattering of alpha particle against the gold. Then that is the first time when he found the, the, the structure of atoms. They prove that the existence of a core inside the atoms, that could be the, that could be counting as also the beginning of the nuclear physics. And of course, there are also many important discoveries like the, like the Liu Chong in 1932. And after that, we understand a plus the discovery made by Lutzford that there are proton inside the nucleus, right? So we understand the nucleus is composed of the proton and the neutrons. Right? Then, can we see that the nuclear physics started already? But not yet. Because we don't know the interaction between the nucleus. Right? So after the 
Japanese physicist, then we know that the atomic nucleus is composed of the proton and the neutron, and they, inter they interacting with each other by exchanging the masons. In principle, in principle, people say in principle we use that so much, but in principle means nonsense, nonsense, nothing, because after you know the composition and also the interaction, in principle we can solve this problem, right? So we don't have to sit in here to discuss nuclear physics, but this doesn't work out because already. You see, in 1937, the students of Heisenberg, they try to use perturbation theory to solve the problem of the nucleus, right? But this turned out not, doesn't work, because we already know strong interaction could be treated perturbatively. What can we do? So, what can we do? Everything is done by approximation or by phenomenological uh, approach. So, so far, if you're talking about the nuclear physics, it's very embarrassing, but that is a fact. We try to see we solve everything self consistently microscopically, but if you examine very carefully, everything brought in something phenomenologically. Either the interaction or using the approach. Everything is coming up with approximation. But maybe that is also the good point of physics because. In physics, you see, we all, we, we always try to assume some ideal condition or try to solve this problem in some ideal case. Then that is essentially the physics. So therefore, already in last century, because we don't know how to treat the nucleus microscopically, so we have to do that by phenomenological way. So if we put the neutron and the proton inside the nucleus from the quantum mechanics, we already know how can we do that, right? We don't know the interaction. We don't know how, we don't, we cannot treat the interaction by perturbative way then what can we do? What we, we simply assume, we assume the so-called the mean field approximation that all the proton and neutron they interacting with each other by this strong nuclear force. We cannot treat them exactly, but we can assume all the nucleons moving in, independently within some mean field pot potential. This is the first time this mean field approximation is applied in nuclear physics, and you will see st even today, we're still thinking about the nuclear moving in a mean field potential inside the nuclear, in some sense, in one sense or in the other, right? So what kind of the mean field we can we use to treat the nuclear system? Right? From the quantum mechanics, there are not so many models we can solve. The simple thing is that, uh, for example, we, we can solve is uh, harmonic oscillator potential. But even before that, as mentioned this morning, that uh, in the 30s, there already the discovery of this liquid drop model, right? This liquid drop model is very simple because you simply from the property of the nucleus, right? 
So if you're thinking about what is the property of the nucleus, if you see the nucleus, the bending energy, right, the average bending energy per nuclear is almost a constant, right? So in such a way, we can build up the so-called the nickel drop model. We have the volume terms. And then thinking about the nucleus, the nucleus moving on the surface of the nucleus, they must have some correction for that. That is so-called the surface term. And then for the nucleus, the proton inside the nucleus, the, the proton is positively charged. Therefore, the coulomb repulsion. This part we know that so, so well. So you will see this nickel drop model, these three terms were def is defined. And then if you're looking at the nuclear chart, you will see all the stable nuclear. They almost have equal number of protons with the neutron. So if you're looking at the nuclear chart, there, you know, all this nuclear st stability nine have almost equal proton and a number. That means the nuclear always prefer to have equal number of neutron and protons. In such a way, we could put in the the so-called the symmetry terms. And then this last terms here, this morning there are already some students ask question, what is this BP? That means pen energy, right? Also put it sometimes as delta. These terms appear because there are more even even nuclear exist in nature than all the even nuclear or all the other nuclear. Therefore, putting this together, that is already more or less the first, first beautiful nuclear model we have ever known. So I suppose everybody here should understand this model. From this model, we can already do a lot, right? For example, from this model, can we know what about the stability line? Right? How to, how can we do that? So the simple way is that for a given number z, we found the derivative of the bending energy and what could be the maximum bending energy for a given z. Then we immediately we get a relation between the neutron number and the proton number. I suppose you can, or you already learned that from the textbook. And then my second question comes, from this leak drop model, can we learn about the boundary of the nuclear chart? Can we define the proton drip line or the new song drip line. By the way, does everybody know what is a new song drip line? A little bit louder? Or, or, or in other way, is is in the correct way, but not well defined, right? The trip line could be means that uh, when you adding neutron or adding new protons, that do doesn't add bending. Or you will remove a proton or the neutron from the nuclear, you doesn't cost energy, right? So that's the trip line. So in such a way that uh, we can define already. Sorry, maybe I, for the students, it would be better to understand that uh, if you are the perfect uh, nuclear structure model, yeah. we would be able to say where the drift line should be. 
Yeah. 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 Y
And later on, you will see in the, in the future nuclear models, this kind of property has always been remembered. Even in the, for example, in the people study the equation of state, and the many studied from here. Okay, apart from that, I try to introduce you this nuclear phenomenology because I think that if we study nuclear models, we try to understand what we try to describe us, right? So the play in, the, in this slide, I just try to give you some feeling what the nuclear mass could tell us. And then what the next thing is about the nuclear size. Nuclear size is, a imp is also a very important effect. Because in the last uh, four decades, the nuclear halo phenomena has been very important topic in nuclear physics. And the halo phenomena is simply because this halo nuclear has a nuclear size much bigger than the neighbors, right? So in order to understand the halo phenomena, we must understand normally what is the nuclear size. From the test book, or if we we if we talking about the nuclear as a nuclear drop, then simply we are talking about their incompatibilities. So in the textbook, they told us that the nuclear size follows this a to the one third pole, right? Follows this a to the one third pole. You see, that means. When we're talking about the nuclear size, the, the atomic nuclear has a, has a radio that's proportional to the one to the one third. And uh, this formula has been written everywhere in this textbook, right? But about 50 years ago, there are some people, they try to analyze they use the, the experimental value available then. Then they plot in this figure. In this big figure, the, this x is the, the horizontal x is the, the mass number, right? And then the vertical x is, what is the, this x? This is the radio divided by a to the one third, right? So if you measure the one experimenter, you simply put this point here, right? So if this is a constant, then we should see something like this, right? But after you plotting this figure, you already found, you already found that this ratio, they decreasing with the mass number, right? Then the question comes, what is the nuclear size? In fact, when we're talking about the nuclear size, the nuclear size obtained at that time is the so-called the nuclear charge ready, right? The charge ready essentially corresponding to the proton distribution inside the nucleus, right? Therefore, when the protein is in the, the same way, but they change this vertical x as z charge radio over the z to the one third, then immediately, they found this become horizontal, become parallel to the horizontal axis again. So in such a way, they already told us they already they 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 observe some mechanism over the these observations, 
right? For example, the charge ready reflects the the proton distribution inside the nucleus, and they are related to the proton number, not necessarily to the total numbers. And then, as that goes on, you will see this is twenty years ago with more new, uh, more charge radio available. Then you will find this line become a band. Why? Why? Because as more and more nucleus far away from the stability line, with that charge ready measured, then the validity you will find that is already divided from this line. Right? From this figure, they already told us that when we study this nucleus and the proton charge ready is related not only to their proton numbers, but also in some sense they are correlated with their neutron number inside this nucleus. By the way, this figure for me is very interesting and very attractive. But the important thing is that as a solution, you know, to do to know understand some theory is definitely important. Uh, but apart from nuclear theory or different theoretical approach, what we should often do is also try to analyze some data. Try to plot in this figure in own way to understand the physics behind. So, in such a way that is already told us, oh, sorry, this size and the nucleus. And then, with the mass available, we're talking about the shear models. People, there are already people talking about the shear model. And then, if you look in nowadays in the Journal of the Nuclear Physics, there are quite a lot of talk about the appearance of new magic number and the disappearance of magic number. Why? Because magic number means the shear structure inside the nucleus. And this is, in some sense, the foundation of all the nuclear models. And for the nuclear far away from the stability line, then when the people are talking about the disappearance of traditional magic number and the appearance of new magic numbers, then we shouldn't remember what we, we may perhaps we should go back to the textbook, how the magic number appears in the textbook, how the people suggested their shear structure, what is their external signals, in such a way, then we try to use these criteria to judge the magic number we're talking about is still the same as before or some new phenomena has appeared. So for example, I just try to use this slide from the, some typical textbook. They told us this is two nuclear separation energy as a function of nuclear numbers, either as, as a proton number or as a neutron numbers, right? So essentially, this, these figures follow from this figure. In this figure, we're simply using the bending energy divided by the mass number. Then we have so-called the, the average Bending energy per nuclear. And in this figure, we simply took that two neutron separation energy. In some sense, this is a kind of a derivative of the bending energy. And then we, when we plot in this figure, you will see this is for the two proton separation energy here. In fact, for the proton separation energy, there are not so many. 
so from the statistics, is not so evident. But if you look at the neutron to neutron separation energy, is very easy to see. You will see that, uh, for example, the so-called the traditional match number we're talking about, eight, twenty, or twenty-eight, fifty, eighty-two, one twenty-six. For this nuclear, the two neutron separation energy extremely big. What does that mean? That means this nuclear with this neutron number, this neutron get expanding. So this is so called the magic number or the stability of this magic nuclear means. And then if we understand the neutron, of course, the proton case is easy to understand, right? And then we could see the in the proton or neutron case. There also appear such so called magic number. And then, of course, using the same te technology nowadays with new mass measured, we can also apply the same techniques, try to extract the, the so-called the two neutron separation energy to see what is the new magic number. And essentially, when we study exotic nuclear, that is what we are doing. And there are also some people do the so-called the R process or nuclear synthesis or investigate the, the origin of the nucleus. If we examine the abundance of the nuclear in the universe, then you could see also such appearance of the magic number in the in the Solar abundance, and this is easy to see. But another very exciting or very very attractive appearance is this charge radius. You will see this nuclear size deviations. How to you could see this beautiful pattern here, right? This beautiful pattern clearly indicates, for example, this neutron magic numbers. And uh, this pattern, if we have this pattern, of course, we immediately will pay attention to what this pattern told us. But uh, to, to how to plot in this pattern is not that easy. You see, this pattern is doing as this. This is delta R divided by delta R average. Then delta R means, you see, the difference of the, the, the radio difference of the neighboring nuclear. We put it as delta R. The delta R average means if we believe in the, the empirical formula, that's the nuclear size is just as this, they are proportional to their mass number. Then we put the, the difference as the increase of the mass number as their average. So that is this way. So in such a way, you could say immediately the deviation for the appearance of magic number immediately enlarged. So in such a way, you could see this from the nuclear size, how they told us the, the, the magic number. And this is a neutron capture, cap, capture uh, cross-section, and also this alpha decay half knife. From this information, immediately they told us what is the nuclear magic number. Well, Nowadays, if we want to study the exotic nuclear, still this technique is very important. Right? This is very important. Okay, so once we understand that 
that is a that's the magic number is so important. So all this nuclear model try to understand the nucleus should have correct shear structure and should reproduce the so-called the magic number. Right? So essentially that is the traditionally in the development of the nuclear model, how this should be done. But uh, thinking about in the last century, in the 40s, without I mean computer, we try to solve quantum mechanical problems. What we can solve analytically, the nuclear potential we can solve analytically is either the harmonic oscillator potential or the square wheel, right? So this is how the how the potential looks like. This is so called as a square uh, square wheel potential, and this is harmonic oscillator potentials. So with this potential, you could see immediately we cannot understand we cannot understand the so called the magic number, right? So what can we do? So the the important the important importance of the nuclear structure is not to find the square wall, but the importance of introducing a spin orbit potential. Right? Because this is really different from atomic physics. From atomic physics, this spin optical potential could be treated perturbatively. But in nuclear physics, we have to have a strong orbit of potential. So you will see this is the great contribution of Maya and Jensen that introduced the spin orbital potential. By the way, if you're looking at this spin orbital potential, you will see this is really a great idea. The idea is very important because if you're looking at this is the harmonic oscillator potential, and if you're looking at this single particle level here, we cannot have the magic number. But if you introduce the magic number, the spin of the potential, then you can split these numbers. For example, the 1p orbiter, if you added spin orbital potential, you can have 1p3 half and 1p1 half. Right? And then for 1d here, you can have 1d5 half and 1d3 half. How to have this splitting? Nobody knows. But because at that time, we don't have so many knowledge, what we have is constrained from experiment. We know the magic number. We have to try to reproduce this magic number. So in such a way, that is so-called the near single model is so successful because by fitting the data, they can reproduce almost all the magic numbers, right? So that is also something we should learn from. We should always remember what is the constraint from experiment, what we should try to reproduce, and what is the key physics we should take into account. So from what we have known about the nuclear shear model, then we should understand the spin of the potential is very important. We understand that the, the shear model by Maya and Jensen could explain well the magic number. But what is missing is the splitting. How to control this splitting? Of course, by reproducing the data, that means in order to reproduce the magic number, this splitting should be like this size. But how to provide this size? 
we should go further. Maybe after relativistic density functional theory, you know much better why we need such a size, right? And then, what is amazing here, you will see, I just mentioned here, but uh, maybe later on you will understand that. Essentially, in the textbook of Bohr and Murchison, which was published in 1975, so you will see by Study the harmonica of Snyder, harmonica of Snyder, but uh, actually deformed harmonica of Snyder. They already found that uh, for this, you know, t this morning people asked what is the deformation, the, deform de de the definition of the deformation. Here is the so called the kind of definition of the, uh, uh, of the deformation. That means this is uh, the symmetry x and uh, the x perpendicular to the symmetry x, that difference. So the ratio here, you could say, is spherical one, that means this must be zero. If it's point 0.5, that means the ratio is two to one or something like that. Already in, in the 75, they found, for example, if the nuclear size, the ratio is two to one or three to one or something like that, you could have a kind of a new magic number appears, right? Night on, night on, experimentalists were found that this is corresponding to some so-called super deformed, super deformation of the atomic nuclear. So in these things, you could see from the model if you can believe in your model. You have your confidence in your model. Your model pro predicts something. Please try to understand that. Because several years later, they could be proved that is correct. The same thing is also true. You could see in this textbook, they, they so to say, they examine how the single particle numbers changing with the mass numbers. You will nowadays in the literature people study quite a lot about the single particle number changing with mass number. Why? Because now we produce more and more nuclear far away from the stability line, so such study become possible. Yeah. But in principle, such ideas are already there in the classical textbook. So sometimes I always suggest the students try to read this classical textbook. You could find some interesting ideas there. By the way, then this is big this is another discovery. I should mention, you see. In the 1949, these people are trying to understand the magic number. They introduce the spin of the potential, then they have the shear structure. But what is interesting here is this, in 1969, almost the two groups of the people, they independently discover something they independently discover something. You see, according to what I learned from them, they told me personally that, look, this is a harmonic of a single particle never. After they introduce spin of the potential, you see one S, that is magic number two. One P should be separated into 1p3 half and 1p1 half. If the se separation is too big, we will have a magic number six we don't want. So the control the separation, not so big, so we have still the magic number eight. And then go to the next the shear, this is 1d3 half and 1d5 half here. 
right? So we have this 20 here. And because we need the 28, so this 1F should split it in 1F7 half and 1 half, half, 5 half here. So that we have 28 here. And then for the 50 magic number, we should have 1G split it into 1G9 half and 1G7 half here. In such a way, we have 50 magic number here. Everybody is celebrating the successful reproduction of the magic number. But these two, these two groups, they are different. They are different. What is there, why they are different? I suppose they don't like the spin of the potential. They don't like the spin of the potential, so they try to find something which preserve the spin symmetry. Then what they found is that, look, after you reproduce the magic number, what you end up is 1D3 half and 2S1 half, which are very close to each other, right? And then if you're looking at the angular momentum, is one half, one half and three half. If the orbit angular momentum is one, there must be a spin of the pattern, right? And then if you go, continue to go, you will come here, this is, uh, this is so-called the, the F five half and P three half. Right? If the orbital angular momentum is two, again, the, the pair of spin orbit pattern. Go next one, right? If you continue, then this is one S one half and a three S one half and a two D three half. Again, there could be a pair of spin pattern, right? So, then they proposed something which is really brief. They proposed that these pairs must be a kind of spin pattern. Because, because you could see they are not real spin. So, they could put it a shoulder spin pattern. Because their splitting is not so big, so they propose that there must be shoulder spin symmetry. So far, nothing is special, right? So far, nothing is special. You look into some single particle spectrum, you're enabling them, you give a new name, right? So nothing is special. But this is really what these people are doing in 90, 1969, right? Almost 40, 45 years? No. How many? 50, almost 55 years ago, sorry. <laughs> almost 50 years, five years ago. And this, this, this kind of Propose is really brief. And uh, according to Anima, Anima passed away, by the way, two years ago, and her mother was he, his students. And uh, Anima told me he was very excited. So he told the story to her mother. And her mother was so polite and said, oh, seems interesting, but so what? But uh, very interesting is that then when Arima visited the U.S., he gives a talk there. The people sitting in the audience found that they, they came almost to the same idea, right? Later on, I will tell you what is the shooter spin symmetry. Because, 
because nobody understand. No, nobody understand what is should mean sumi sui is. Nobody know. Until thirty years later, the people found that in the Dirac equation, we have up components and low components. Up components have the normal spin partners, and low components is corresponding to the shoulder spin partners. So that is a really a big surprise to everybody, because before we don't know that. Even the shoulder spin symmetry, you see, they proposed in the '69, but it was for almost forgotten for 20 years. Then after the people found the identical band, the people go back to the shoulder spin symmetry. But many really don't know what is the shoulder spin symmetry. Night on. We found our oh, shoulder spin symmetry. So called the shoulder spin symmetry is crisp or should orbit should orbit the angular matter. Okay. Then yeah. This should orbit angular matter is simply the orbit angular matter for the low components of the Dirac spin. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Hello. Shall we? Shall we start? Okay. So, uh, so please don't worry. Uh, night on. And we will return back to this story of the shoulder spin. So you will find that that is quite interesting. That, for example, the concept of the shoulder spin and the Dirac equation and the supersymmetry, all this kind of stuff, could be connected with each other. So this also gave us the confidence that, for example, when we studied the I will also introduce it a bit more. Somehow, I found that uh, if we study the science, science sometimes is active because science is done by human being. So try to understand how this human being started to thinking about this idea, and some of this idea could die, but some of this idea could go forever. So try to think it over. Sometimes is very useful, and the, I try to accumulate or organize the material in such a way so that you can realize that uh, from one approach to another approach, we didn't totally forget one model, but uh, we just uh, found what is the attractive part from the old model, and what is the uh, what is a new, or what is what is really interesting in the new approach we proposed, right? So, in some way that we really could, so to say, push the development of the the fields. Okay, so then please remember all of this story could couldn't be understood. In the non-relativistic approach, but a night on in the relativistic approach, yeah, where everything will become very clear. And then you will see that, uh, for example, the people ask me this question, right? You will see this shear model successfully explain the magic number, but can it do something about the nuclear binding energy? No, because very really simple. Even though the single particle spectrum could explain well the magic number, but the single particle from the single particle energy, we cannot get any information about the total bending of the nucleus, right? So what what could be done? 
the the important idea come from the come from the the Studinsky. This is a really a great idea because I, if you remember, I I remind you in this picture, you could see this liquid drop model. More nice, they give the correct trend of the nuclear bending. Right? This is not that easy because within such a simple model, this line going to the middle of the of the experimental data. What is missing is the fluctuation. For each nuclear, they are fluctuated around this nickel drop model. Right? Then from this single particle level, we cannot we cannot use that to describe the nuclear bending. Then the great contribution of students, students is this. He see that okay, this is a, this is a dualistically we solve this nuclear. Uh, is about a nine two eight, and then this is one s one half, and what the single particle never looked like this. And then what Studinsky is doing is this. He say okay. If you so looking at this single particle levels, you will find this uniform distribution is distorted by the shear model. So what he tried to do is that using this model, he tried to separate this as a smooth part and the, the fluctuation part, right? So in this paper, they they introduce the the smoothen approach to get this level density, and then just extracted the fluctuation part, and then the fluctuation part they put on top of the nickel drop model, in such a way they can reproduce well the bending energy, right? And the, this again from logical. But the idea is great. The idea is try to separate the smooth part and the fluctuation part. Thinking about that, if you go to the stock market, you know the the you know the stock market the the it's always go up and down. If we could separate the smooth part and the fluctuation part. Then immediately you can become a binima, right? And also, apart from that, for example, some people see they are working for the R process or nuclear synthesis calculation. If you are working on the nuclear synthesis calculation, you need you need the nuclear level density, right? Then when you need use the nuclear level density. You you put that part in the nuclear con in the in the in the you know in the dead basis for the R process calculation, you will find that there are some big fluctuation you cannot handle. Then perhaps this smoothing part could work so well. I mean how for the nuclear bending energy, these two parts putting together work quite well. Uh, you know, they use simply the smooth part. They use the nickel drop model. On top of that, they use the shear model and extracting the flat fluctuation part. And then they put in, they put these two parts together. Then they try to describe the nuclear bending. And uh, in nuclear models or in the nuclear mass models. The most famous one is the finite range drop drop net model. In this fin finite range drop net model, what they did is that they introduced more parameter. For the nickel drop, is simply for spherical. So each coefficient they introduce more parameter, and then for the sh shear model part. 
They also introduce more parameters. Totally, they introduced something like 40 parameter, and then they couldn't produce the nuclear binding energy up to 700 keV. 700 keV is not that easy. Yeah, totally, the several, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are 3,000 nuclear observed. Nice, a little bit nicer than 3,000 nuclear was mass measured. Then they, are, they come with 40 parameter, they can reproduce the data by 700 keV. 700 keV is, is not easy because for heavy nuclear, there are several thousand MeV. So this accuracy is relatively high. The only thing is that there are too many parameters and they are phenomenological, right? And uh, then you see, but already this model from nuclear physics, from actual physics, they need such a databases. So the, this citation is very high. And then on, on top of that, a couple of years ago, a group of Chinese, what they did is that they found that, for example, why don't we use density function to replace this nuclear drop model? Meanwhile, they did two important things. One important thing is so called the ISO spin, high ISO spin dependence for the spin of the potential. Remember, I can spin of the potential. So, how to take into account the ISO spin dependence parameter, right? It works, but we don't know why. And then they also take into account the symmetry energy and also the the difference of the mineral nuclear. And the parameter is comparable, but immediately they, 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 they produce the deviation by a factor of two. And then I also contribute a little bit more for that, is that you see, I always see in this phenomenological model, because the nuclear size is changed, right? Nuclear size is changed. If you want to use phenomenological model, the nuclear potential sh also should be modified. How to modify according to the size of this nuclear? Then again, the you know this this size is reproduced to nicely three hundred keV. This is almost to the limit. This is almost to the limit of the nuclear models. From logical model, so far, that's almost what we can do. To go one step further, then we should go to some more deep or more microscopic approach. For example, this Fact I mentioned here, the ISO spin dependence for the spin of the potential, or the ISO spin dependence for the symmetry energy, and so on. This kind of sense we should find the physics reason, or should find the microscopic mechanism behind them, right? Then this morning we there are people talking about some superconductivity or superfluidity. Uh, superfluidity in, in atomic nuclear. In fact, uh, this kind of, this kind of uh, phenomenon was proposed in nuclear physics almost the same time as the superconductivity. Well, almost at the same time as in super con uh, superconductivity. But then you will see that in nuclear physics, why we have such kind of a suggestion that we should treat in nuclear 
superfluidity. The reason is very simple, because if you are looking at the energy spectrums, you see this cycle means even even nuclear. Uh, cross means odd A nucleus. So you will find that there is energy gap in the intrinsic energy spectrum of nuclear for the even even nuclear compared with the, the odd mass nuclear. And apart from that, you see this is all the even mass difference. You see, if you define this, all the even mass difference as the bending energy for the difference of the bending energy with the neighboring nuclear. This is the, the bending energy nuclear for Z, for N plus one, and n minus one. Similarly, you can also do that for z plus one and z minus one. Then immediately you could see this is zigzag, right? This is the experimental evidence for superconductivity in nucleus. And uh, this could be seen from the bending energy. And you can see that also from low line spectrum. This is even even nuclear, and this is uh, even the old n nuclear. This even even and even old and even even. You could see there is an energy gap here, right? And uh, also for the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia, you could see that in you could see uh, if you take this ex experimental value, and this is uh, all the so called the uh, rigid body, rigid body moment of inertia. So it's uh, always two or three times high than the experimental values. But if you including the pattern correlation, the moment of inertia, immediately reduced by a factor of two, or even sometimes three. So clearly, this shows that in nucleus, the nuclear nuclear they are existing, the pattern correlation, we should be treated. So therefore, when you develop a nuclear structure model, how to treat the pattern correlation is very important. By the way, if you look into about the nuclear physics, for example, fishing or the reactivity, which just was observed in the beginning of the nuclear physics, but still such a long time passed, we are still thinking about how to treat this problem. Same thing is also true for the nuclear pattern correlation. And in particular, for example, apart from the, the so-called neutron-neutron pattern, neutron-proton pattern, they exist in also uh, neutron-proton pattern in nuclear physics. The, the, this is a kind of the evidence. For example, here, we define the so-called the residual interaction. What is a residual interaction? Separation energy is the derivative of the bending energy. Residual interaction is the signal derivative of the, the bending energy. So in such a way, we can define the so-called the neutron-proton residual interaction, right? And then this neutron proton residual interaction from the experimental value, we can always plot in such a figure. And then if you plot in such a figure, you could see for this n equals z nuclear. 
when the neutron number and proton number are the same, they are always deviated from the other nucleus, right? So this kind of systematic deviation told us this there must be something unique for this n equals z nucleus. And similarly, you could see this is a spectrum for this even even nuclear. All the old nucle sorry, all the old nu nuclear. You see, for this uh, n equal z equal odd number nucleus, you you will see there is a big energy gap in the low line spectrum, right? So this also told us that this is the evidence for the proton neutron pattern correlation in nuclear physics. So remember this is also important because night on you will see experimentally the for the observe some apolomal phenomena. We can always go back and check what is the information, what, what is the uh, what is the components meeting meeting there? And if you plot in, for example, this is a definition of the panning gap, and then if you plot in the panning gap here, you will see how they look the neck, right? How the global, how the panning correlation looks like in this nuclear. Do you have any question or problem? Please just If not, then we just continue. Okay. So in the most part of this uh, of here, before we're talking about the most most of the nuclear ground properties. Now we are talking about the so-called excitation property of the nucleus. And if you, we want to de develop the nuclear, or for example, when if this do a nativity density functional approach. Uh, we not only want to describe all the nuclear property, but also the excitation properties. So one of the most important thing we would like to address is the notation of excitation of the nucleus, right? So for the nuclear excitation uh, properties, then the, of course, one of the most important things is so-called the, the rotational excitation, right? So for the nuclear rotational excitation, then the first thing we want to discuss is about the so-called high-spin phenomenon. So what is the high-spin phenomenon? The high-spin phenomenon is the, you know, the nucleus could be highly or fastly notated with very high angular momentum. How to produce them is in such a way you see uh, this is a reaction, right? This is uh, for argon-40 bombarding on tin nucleus and then the composite or the produce a compound nucleus. This compound nuclear is hot, right? For so it's highly excited. Then how to how to de excite it? They could emit it up to four neutrons or six, several neutrons. 
And these neutrons, of course, we already know that uh, each neutron, they were emitted away and uh, they were taken away energy. But this neutron doesn't take away angular momentum. So you will see the compound nuclear immediately they, because they are so hard and then immediately they decay to this nine. This nine means they have very high angular momentum, but for given angular momentum, they have the no stainage. So in 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 nuclear physics, they are called the so called the yellow band. The yellow band means for given angular momentum, they always have the no stainage. That means that excitation energy is purely produced by the notation. They are purely excited by the notation. Then in such a way, we really could investigate the purely notating property of the nucleus. And then you will see in such a way, you see that the, the nucleus could be reproduced with angular momentum up to 60 h-bar. 60 h-bar, if you're thinking about in the ang each nuclear carrier about, about 10 h-bar angular momentum, so we need a three pair of the nuclear, apart from sometimes, of course, some of the angular momentum was contributed by the collective notation. But the nuclear and the the, the collective notation put in together, they could, they could be excited up to 60 h-bar. And then with this phenomenon, with this high angle momentum, and the, you see, this is the, this is energy as a function of the angular momentum. And then, of course, you, if you remember that uh, from the, from the, uh, from the classical uh, physics, we know that the energy of the classical notor is simply, you know, that the angular momentum, the notational energy is related to the amount of inertia by this formula, right? And then from this formula, we can extract it, the amount of inertia as a function of the so called the the notational frequency. From the notational frequency, immediately you could see this S shaped uh, amount of inertia changing with the notational frequency. So this traditionally, you know, is heavily investigated in the 60s and also in the 70s because people uh, supposed this is related with the phase transition in nuclear physics. This is so-called maybe the, the first time the phase transition of nuclear physics because this part, you see the amount of inertia is quite smaller, but this part, the amount of inertia is almost, you see, two or three times bigger than this part, right? And then if you remember, if you remember this figure, right? So immediately, this was recognized as a kind of phase transition in nuclear physics, right? But, you will see as a finite system, 
nuclear is not like the solid system because we only have a finite number of the nucleons. So this phase transition in nuclear physics is a little bit different. And uh, this kind of phenomenon night on was interpreted in different way instead of the phase transitions. But uh, already this has already attracted a lot of attention in nuclear physics. And uh, I suppose that uh, that time we will come back to this part. And uh, phenomenologically, you know, this kind of transition, this energy spectrum, phenomenologically, they are also not of interesting investigated investigation. I just uh, show you a very simple analysis of the data. For example, in the textbook we're talking about, you see, we when we see the 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 energy could be written in such a way, this is so called the 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 rigid body, right? or the ideal case. When the nucleus deviated from this ideal case, then one could say, okay, maybe we should edit another terms here. That means the nucleus is the divided from ideal lotus, right? So we have a signal terms. But then you will see this second term has a problem because I square times A plus one to the square is a big quantity as the angular momentum increase. So you will see this term will divide it, right? And then there's another suggestion. Instead of the expansion in amount of inertia, one could introduce introduce a kind of the angle, uh, notation of frequency, we could write in the energy spectrum as the expansion of the uh, notation of frequency. Right? Then, the question comes, which one is better? Right? There is another formula. You could see, have you, can you imagine this Energy spectrum could be written in such a way. It's, it's very interesting because uh, this formula could be derived in such a way. You could see that uh, here we see this, this energy, could, you know, the energy is in, could be written in such a way. But if we assume, if we assume, the inertia, amount of inertia is, amount of inertia is related or is proportional to, to the energy. This is a very simple assumption, right? And it seems also reasonable. Could, because the amount of inertia could be depending on the energy, right? But then if you're writing the amount of inertia in such a way, you put this back, and then after you drive, immediately you can end up with such an equation. And also, if you're familiar with the collective Hamiltonian, or poor collective Hamiltonian for nucleus, if you assume that the, the nuclear is many actually deformed and treating the triaxial deformation positively, finally you could end up with such a notational formula. Then the question comes, if you have said, if you observed the nuclear notational spectrum, you have what kind of this formula then the question comes, which formula is better? 
and needs that if you could understand or if you found a way to judge which formula is better, then that on or microscopically you could see which one could give us the most uh, uh, exact formula, uh, information. The interesting thing is that there is such a so-called Marman formula. The idea is this. You see, they introduce the two quantities. The, the first quantity, oh, sorry. They introduce the, the f two quantities. The quantity is Ra. That means the excitation of the of the EM the excitation energy of the angular momentum A to the lowest energy. Then use simply use two of these quantities, and then all these formulas will become a nine in this two-dimensional plot. And then each nuclear, you could define, put this point here, you could see experimentally which formula they will prefer, right? Then in such a way, you could choose the best, best formula for notational spectrum. So surprisingly, you will find that, for example, this formula will by assume the moment of inertia is depending on the energy. You end up with this formula. Finally, they produce this data quite well, right? They produce this data quite well. So that on when you investigated the energy spectrum, you will realize that the moment of inertia for this notational band in, in the one way or the other always, always connected with the, the, the energy. And then, if you remember that uh, I mentioned that uh, in the old textbook of Bohr and Motorson, they mentioned that when the down x and the short x of the nucleus has a ratio of 1 to 2 or 2 to 1, or in some sense, the system could become more stable, or a new magic number will appear, right? So this is exactly how this prediction was observed experimentally. Definitely the, the dualistic case is much more complicated because uh, when you thinking about this system, they are much more complicated. This is the energy uh, surface or potential energy surface of the nuclear, and if this is the, the, the ground state, this is the second minimum, and third minimum, and this fish, and so on. This is schematic way. And then you will see this ground state, and here you have the, the ratio, the nuclear is much more elongated, with the down x, about two times than the short axis. And then if not, the nuclear is much more elongated, then you will find the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is much bigger. Much bigger and almost like a rigid body. And then they will have a very beautiful spectrum. And this is exactly experimentally have observed in the 80s, in the 80s. So this is the so-called the, the shoe-port deformed, shoe deformed band observed 
in the 80s. So you will see if we want to describe the nuclear phenomena, not only the ground state or the back, the band crossing, or like the super, the disappearance of superfluidity, and also this super deformed notational band. We should try to describe us. In particular, if you are working in the relativity density function, all of this should be treated on the same footings. So this is not easy. Before, when I'm talking about this phenomenon, you will find they could be treated in different way, right? They could be treated either phenomenologically or with, you know, with a fixed potential mean field approximation. But uh, all of this, when we apply the relativity density function, we will try to describe all this, the, all this kind of phenomena on the same footings. In particularly, you will see that uh, this is uh, the, so far, as I mentioned before, they are already reached to the highest angle momentum about 60 h bar. So these are in our approach. Another thing is that when we're talking about this nu nuclear is highly deformed, is highly deformed. Because the nuclear, they already have a down x and a short x about the ratio of two to one. On another extreme, on another extreme is that uh, if the nuclear is spherical, right? If this nuclear is, is a spherical, then what can we do? Because experimentally, experimentally, we also observed such excitation spectrum in this nucleus. Right? So how to describe the super deformed notation and also this notation in this spectrum is quite challenging. The challenging is that because in this case, what we have to treat is so-called the collective notation, right? The nuclear is because it's, the deformation is so large, so essentially the third way we have to develop is that they can treat this, this kind of collective notation. And then for this nuclear, it's almost near spherical. Then the question comes, because in this near spherical system, in principle, the nuclear doesn't notate, right? Because from quantum mechanics, we know that uh, this nuclear notating is gi give only a phase factor that not really exciting the nuclear. But then, how, the, how are these spectrums come from? How are this spectrum come from? And then, of course, carefully studying, you will find although this nuclear are spherical, but the nuclear moving inside the nucleus, they could sit in very high angle momentum orbit. And then if the, both the proton and the neutron are sitting in very high angle momentum orbit, the angle momentum could interact in or could company in such a way that this company provided different scheme. With this kind of scheme, then finally we have this energy spectrum. But then we must be able to treat in such a system how the angle momentum of the proton and neutron coupled together, right? 
This is also the challenging of the nuclear physics. From one part that uh, you see, we are different from the, the atomic physics because they are treating essentially the electrons. But uh, we, for us, we, are treat, we have to treat in proton and neutron simultaneously. And then this, the, the, uh, you know, the, the coupling between the proton and neutron make this uh, solution much more difficult. But at the same time, they also provide us some new interesting phenomena. And uh, I just uh, give you an example. For example, uh, this is uh, so called the Kylo notation. The Kylo notation we're talking about. For example, how this Kylo notation appears in the Kylo notation, for example, previously in this nuclear, we are talking about this spherical nuclear. So they only have proton and neutron, the company makes this spectrum. But for the kernel notation, instead of the proton and neutron rotating in such a way, the nuclear is not spherical. The nuclear is not spherical. So they could rotating in some way. And then the rotating of the core together with the valence proton and neutron, if you look into the the angle momentum space, you could see the orientation of the angle momentum is a kind of minor symmetry. And uh, this kind of notation is together with the image in the mirror could be kylosymmetric. This kind of kylosymmetric, if you treat the system in such a way, it will appear as a kind of a degenerate band. And this degenerate generated band, or if you look into similar as these spectrums, if the, you, you have kernel notation, you will have almost a, all this spectrum almost will be doubled. And this doubling of this kernel spectrum is a kind of a signature for the kernel notations. And then putting this together, this is a, the interesting phenomenon for the chiral notation. And then again, if we if we want to develop the approach for the for the excitation, we should be able to treat not only the collective notation, single particle excitation, and the coupling of the single particle and a collective this simultaneously. And in fact, uh, this is the experimental observation of the chiral uh, excitation for this uh, N equals 75 isotons. This is a four isotons with the neutron number equal 75. So you will see this is the spectrum how the spectrum appears in these four nucleus. And these four nucleus immediately told us and how this color notation could appear in this nuclear. So maybe we suppose we today we just st stop here. The good point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, if you don't have main question, maybe yeah, please. Yes, uh, the aim of the study is obviously to uh, the plus one or the plus four plus one plus one. The plus one. Oh yeah, oh yeah, this one. Later on, we should do that. And in this moment, or in the, and that times, all of this only could be done by, by experiment. Yeah. So, 
in, in I mean sense that is the, the problem of nuclear physics because most of the time we try to eliminate this uh, the phenomenological by a microscopical approach. Okay. Okay, so if no further question, maybe let's meet together. Yes? <laughs>